Hey, good Wednesday morning. How you doing today? Doing well here in Gearing. It's a beautiful morning. The sun is out. Not a cloud in the sky. Today we are going to be in chapter 31 of Genesis. So if you have your Bible, I'd love for you to go ahead and grab that, open it, turn your phone app on, however you access it. Continuing the story of Jacob and his crazy ways, beginning in verse uh, 22 this morning. Good morning to Nancy and Lori and Ruth and other Lori and others of you who are going to be watching with me today. Glad to see you. <clears throat> A couple things to remind you of just quickly. Uh, this Friday, Cody and uh, the Peterson family are going to be here at some point. We'll send out a text um, to help if you are able to help unload. We'd love for you to be able to do that with them. Um, they have to close on their house at some point on Friday, so we're unsure of the timing of everything, but we'll let you know as soon as we know something. And also, if you would like to support them by bringing a gift card to, uh, to the Westway building, maybe a restaurant gift card or a grocery store gift card, Home Depot or Menards, um, just to help them grab things that they're going to need to grab, as people always do when they move places. Um, we just want to love them and support them, and some ways we can do that are helping them unload their truck and by helping them with some food and other things that they might need over this first um, over this first weekend here, which we're really excited about. So good morning to Simon from Burma. I uh, hope you're um, you're probably your day is probably over. <clears throat> so we are we're in this section of Genesis that um, when I was in Bible college, uh, learned it's called narrative, which is basically, it's just telling a story, um, of what's happening. And we've, we've kind of talked about, um, we've kind of talked about that over the past several years, um, is the Bible just like telling me to do something or is it, um, like so instructive. So the Bible is instructing me. Or is the Bible just telling me what happened, which is um, descriptive? And this is one of those texts where we are in Genesis right now, kind of in the middle of all of this story, where it's just telling us what's what's happening. Um, so it can be hard when we read narrative to pull things out for us, which ought to tell us something. And we're going to talk more about that after we read today's text. So, um, so we're going to pick up in verse 21 of Genesis 31 and read at least through the end of this chapter. Um, and again, this is, this is primarily descriptive. It's just telling us what happened. So uh, Jacob has taken his two wives, Rachel and Leah, and he was living with um, their father, Laban. And Jacob has taken his two wives, Laban's daughters, away from Laban, and they are returning back to uh, back to the promised land. He waited until Laban was working um, elsewhere. He was he was away from his house and kind of snuck out with Laban's daughters, Jacob's wives. Um, so that's where we are in the story. Three days later, <clears throat> Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he gathered a group of his relatives and set out in hot pursuit. He caught up with Jacob seven days later in the hill country of Gilead. But the previous night, God had, had appeared to Laban the Aramean in a dream and told him, I'm warning you, leave Jacob alone. Laban caught up with Jacob 
as he was camped in the hill country of Gilead, and he set up his camp not far from Jacob's. What do you mean by deceiving me like this? Laban demanded. How dare you drag my daughters away like prisoners of war? Why did you slip away secretly? Why did you deceive me? And why didn't you say you wanted to leave? I would have given you a farewell feast with singing and music accompanied by tambourines and harps. Why didn't you let me kiss my grand kiss my daughters and grandchildren and tell them goodbye. You have acted very foolishly. I could destroy you, but the God of your father appeared to me last night and warned me. Leave Jacob alone. I can understand your feelings that you must go and your intense longing for your father's home. But why have you stolen my gods? If you remember back to yesterday's reading, um, uh, Rachel took... Um, took Laban's like idols, um, his household idols, and took them with her. I rushed away because I was afraid, Jacob answered. I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. But as for your gods, see if you can find them and let the person who has taken them die. And if you find anything else that belongs to you, identify it before all these relatives of ours, and I will give it back. But Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the household idols. Laban went first into Jacob's tent to search for them, to search there, then into Leah's, and then the tents of the two servant wives, but he found nothing. Finally, he went into Rachel's tent. But Rachel had taken the household idols and hidden them in her camel saddle, and now she was sitting on them. When Laban had thoroughly searched her tent without finding them, she said to her father, Please, sir, forgive me if I don't get up for you. I'm having my monthly period. So Laban continued his search, and he could not find the household idols. Then Jacob became very angry, and he challenged Laban. What's my crime, he demanded. What have I done wrong to make you chase after me as though I were a criminal? You've now rummaged through everything I own. Now show me what you found that belongs to you. Set it out here in front of us. <clears throat> before our relatives for all to see, let them judge between us. Lori Reynolds says that Laban is a piece of work. Yes, he is. They all are. Um, we've talked about that so many times over the past um, couple weeks. Um, just, just how each of these characters um, are just human beings. Um, it's really easy for us to look back on them and, um, just think, man, how could they be so, how could they be so dumb? How could they be so selfish? Um, but like we've talked about so many times, remembering that the, that scripture is, um, is a mirror reflecting the reality of God back upon us and reflecting the reality of mankind back upon us, um, like, we're the same way, just in different ways, right? Um, maybe we wouldn't do these things, but we have certainly done other things that are, that, are just as, that are just as bad, that are just as deceitful, that are just as wicked as all of these people are doing. So now, <clears throat> I said yesterday that Jacob is, Jake, I described Jacob as a whiner, and he's... Um, I think he's kind of in full whining mode right now. Um, for 20 years, I've been with you caring for your flocks. In all that time, your sheep and goats never miscarried. In all those years, I never used a single ram of yours for food. If any were attacked and killed by wild animals, I never showed you the carcass and asked you to reduce the count of your flock. No, I took the loss myself. You made me pay for every stolen animal, whether it was taken in broad daylight or in the dark of night. I worked for you through the scorching heat of the day, through cold and sleepless nights. Yes, for 20 years I slaved for your, in your house. I worked for 14 years earning your two daughters, then six more years for your flock. And you changed my wages ten times. In fact, if the God of my father had not been on my side, the God of Abraham and the fearsome God of Isaac... You would have sent me away empty-handed, which is probably true. But God has seen your abuse and my hard work. That's why he appeared to you last night and rebuked you. 
Then Laban replied to Jacob, These women are my daughters, these children are my grandchildren, and these flocks are my flocks. In fact, everything you see is mine. That's not entirely true. But what can I do now about my daughters and their children? So come, let's make a covenant, you and I, and it will be a witness to our commitment. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a monument. Then he told his family members, gather some stones. So they gathered some stones and piled them in a heap. Then Jacob and Laban sat down beside the pile of stones to eat a covenant meal. To commemorate the event, Laban called the place Jagar Sahathutha, which means witness pile in Aramaic, and Jacob called it Gilead, which means witness pile in Hebrew. Then Laban declared, This pile of stones will stand as a witness to remind us of the covenant we made today. This explains why it was called Galid, witness pile. But it was also called Mitzpah, which means watchtower. For Laban said, May the Lord keep watch between us to make sure we keep this covenant when we are out of each other's sight. If you mistreat my daughters or marry any other wives, God will see to it if no one else does. He is a witness to this covenant between us. See this pile of stones, Laban continued, and see this monument I've set between us. They will stand between us as witnesses of our vows. I will never pass this pile of stones to harm you, and you must never pass these stones or this monument to harm me. I call on the God of our ancestors, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of my grandfather Nahor, to serve as a judge between us. So Jacob took an oath before the fearsome God of his father Isaac to respect the boundary. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice to God there on the mountain and invited everyone to a covenant feast. After they had eaten, they had spent they spent the night on the mountain. Laban got up early the next morning <clears throat> and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then he left and returned home. So I said earlier that um, that that the Bible is especially for stories like this. It's just descriptive. It's just telling us what happened. It's narrative. Um, so we want to be careful when we. Um, when we read something like this, we want to be cautious in terms of what we, um, like the word we would normally, the way we talk about this is like, how do I apply this to my life, right? Um, we read a story like this, or lots of things that we've been reading, and a few more things that we're going to be reading over the next um, over the next few weeks as we finish out Genesis, and we have this question. That's great. Well, who cares? What does it mean for me? How do I apply it to my life? Um, well, as something that's dis descriptive, um, it necessarily, like, it may not necessarily have something that we can just pull out and say, this is what I should do because of this. That's why I said it a few minutes ago. That's why trying to understand the Bible as for what it is, not what we think it is, is important. So what does that mean? Um, as I said, the metaphor of the mirror. What does this tell us about humanity? What does it tell us about God? Those are some good questions to ask. Um, as, I, as I read this story earlier this morning, um, the thing that I was mostly reminded of as I thought about, um, maybe, maybe about application, as I thought about application, the thing that I mostly came to, the conclusion that I mostly can, came to, is that we're reading the stories of real people. Um, these things really happened. These are real people, and they are not... They're us in the sense that they are humans, but they are not us in the sense that Laban and Jacob were real people. So that's why we have to be really careful when we take things out of the Bible and apply it to ourselves um, because as we've talked about so many times, um, the Bible's not about us. The Bible is about God. Um, this Bible, the Bible's not to us, right? It was, if this was written at a specific place in a specific time, and we're going to talk more about this, um, here beginning on May 30th, when we, when we open the book of Revelation together, um, this book was written to a group of people about a to a specific group of people about a specific group of people and 
none of those people was us. But that doesn't mean that there's not something for us, right? Um, that doesn't mean that, I mean, this book has endured for thousands of years for a reason. Um, if we were to flip back in the New Testament, we would see that all scriptures God breathed, useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, um, so that the man of God or the woman of God can be fully equipped to do the things that God has for us. So we could ask those kinds of questions when we read story. And I honestly think what we would come away with is um, just what Lori, what Lori Reynolds said, that Laban is a piece of work. Um, we, have this, we have this tendency to, to look back on people in the Bible and think that um, think that they had it all together, um, that they had everything figured out. They were always faithful to what God called them to do. They um, they were always obedient to what God called them to do. They were like these 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 solid rocks of the faith. And one of the things that that a book like Genesis can teach us as we read some of these names that we've heard. Over the years, you know, if you've grown up in church, um, this probably isn't your first experience with Abraham. This isn't your first experience with Isaac or with Jacob. But we tend to forget that they were that they were flawed human beings. And what we're seeing here in in Genesis and in the Old Testament um, and the New Testament to a little lesser degree. What we're seeing here is just the, um, just the sinfulness of man on display. We see our need, we see mankind's need for God on display with, on every page of the book of the Bible. We need God. We need someone else to come in and save us. Because left to our own devices like as Lori said, that Laban's a piece of work. Yep, left to our own devices, so are we. This is this is where this is where their story becomes our story because we see humanity in this. Um, I know the deceitfulness and the trickery of my own heart, and if if you would be honest with yourself for a moment, you would see the dishonesty and the trickery in your own heart. So, <clears throat> as we read through stories like this, again, we want to, we, I know we want to ask this question, okay, that's great. How does this apply to me? And I think that's a reason why when, when we're, when, when we start off like on a Bible reading plan at the beginning of the year and we hit stories like this and we start, we start to ask the wrong questions. And then we get frustrated because we don't know how this applies to us. So then we like we skip ahead to the good stuff. Um, we move past these stories. We read through them quickly. We don't take time to understand what's really happening in them. So one of the things I like about what we're doing right now um, during the week is we're just, we're just reading through the text, right? To be reminded of what's going on in these stories. These aren't skip over stories. I know Lori Reynolds likes to call them the begats when we get to the genealogies. Um, but like the genealogies, uh, stories and narratives like these have a purpose. They have a reason that they're in the Bible. And it may just be that it's telling us what happened. It may just be that it is revealing to us the sinfulness of mankind. And it may be that um, that we come away with this, like, man, what is going on here? Why is God, why is God so insistent on using broken, and fallible and sinful people? And I think when we get to that question, I, then we're starting to get somewhere. Because when we see the the sinfulness of mankind on display in the book of Genesis. Hopefully, we're going to see the sinfulness of mankind on display in our own lives. And when we ask the question, why is God using them? At some point, we need to ask the question, well, why is God using me? 
Um, and then we want to take comfort in that. God can use them despite all of their wickedness, despite all of their sinfulness, despite all of their deceit. And God can use us as well. So I guess I gave you an application, but it takes a while for us to get there. It's not the application that we, that we would normally think. Like we read a story like this and we're like, okay, well, what am I supposed to do today from this story? And stories like, like the ones we've been reading over the past couple weeks and we're going to continue to read force us to um, take a deeper look into, into the Bible and force us to take a deeper look into the, into the humans of the Bible and then into our own humanity so we can wrestle with, with these questions about what, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, tomorrow we're going to pick up in chapter 32. We're probably going to read all of chapter 32 together. So <clears throat> if you have a chance, um, would encourage you to, um, skim over the last few chapters. If you can go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis and skim all the way through up to this point, um, I think that would be, that'd be a good little project for you. Certainly read, um, certainly read with a little more detail the past couple chapters, just to just to build and, and maintain that context, um, and we will pick up here in Genesis chapter thirty-two tomorrow. So I'm going to pray, and then um, we're going to go about our day. So let's do that together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that you worked in the lives of sinful people, <coughs> um, of which uh, of whom we are sinful people. So we thank you for the way that you are working in our lives as well. Um, I ask that you be with each of those that are that are watching this and are going to watch it later today, um, that they would be that they would be filled with the desire to to read and study your word, um, to not skip over chapters, um, to not skip over stories, um, but really to wrestle with um, questions like why is this in the Bible? Who are these people? Why do they do the things they do? And I pray that that would lead them to ask um, those same questions of themselves. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Hey, love you guys. Praying with you, praying for you today. And I hope you have a super day. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. in Genesis 32. See ya.